1948, Joseph Stalin's stepson and high-ranking Politburo member Andrei Zhanov introduced the Soviet government's official ideology on aesthetics, anti-formalism. Non-realistic paintings, non-tonal music, and abstract poetry were all completely banned. He wasn't really proposing a new policy, but rather restating and making official a policy that had been more or less in effect since 1935. Between 1935 and 1953, thousands of artists had their lives ruined, were thrown into gulags or even executed, for being too experimental or just having the misfortune of writing something Stalin personally didn't like. On an unrelated note, the right-wing nutjobs would like you to know that anyone who creates or appreciates non-figurative art is a freedom-hating communist. Modern art, or conceptual art, isn't art at all. It's one big circle jerk of pretentious twats trying to make themselves look sophisticated by ascribing meaning to something that's completely meaningless. This is what happens when lefty social justice warriors and cultural Marxists seize control of something and ruin it for everyone else. No wonder gamers are so terrified of them subverting the video games industry. Conceptual art is another front in the war on objectivism. I have a confession. I like conceptual art. Uh, I like it first and foremost because I can appreciate a well-crafted joke for what it is. Like Damien Hirst's Mother and Child Divided, which looks like this. Did you get it? You get it? Because it's a mother and child divided, but not not the way you thought it was going to be. Okay, maybe you don't find it as funny as I do. But if you don't like modern art, there's a good reason to reconsider. The effect it has on conservatives. There's videos of this woman. Totally bizarro. Sitting here, pulling her shirt up, getting a razor blade and carving a pentagram into her stomach. With the blood dripping on TED Talk, calling this art. That's not art. You don't get it. It's art. Well, the issue here is we've always known this is going on. This is what our intel right. keeps bringing us about who these people are. Seriously, it drives them insane. Like, it's one thing to not get something. It's one thing to aggressively refuse to believe any of the easily available explanations for it. But it's another thing to decide a performance art piece is actually a cover story for a child molestation and cannibalism ring that involves almost every powerful person in the country. And that Donald Trump is secretly waging a shadow war against it. Like, how, how does that happen? Now, I could, of course, talk about Paul, who gets the most worked up about modern art, but... Fuck Paul. And that's well-tread territory. Look, here's all you need to know about what Paul thinks about anything. Look at the callous abomination which is Boston City Hall. Why did they design it like this? Why the daunting exterior combined with the expansive, foreboding, shadeless open space in front? Again, it's about using oppressive brutalism to exert authoritarian control over the population. Paul Joseph Watson thinks the architect of Boston City Hall designed it bad on purpose as part of a communist conspiracy to make the populace more susceptible to big government mind control. If you didn't already know Paul wasn't worth paying attention to, you should now. And if you're about to write a comment arguing semantics saying, what he really said was blah blah. No, look, I don't care. You're a lost cause and you have my pity. So instead, I want to talk about Prager University. Founded by Dennis Prager, who, like Ben Shapiro, is another religious lunatic who decided to play libertarian in order to recruit the feral rat boys of post-Gamergate classical liberalism. Trademark symbol. Scare quote, scare quote, scare quote. You'd probably like evidence of that assertion. So here's Dennis telling wives they're biblically required to put out more for their husbands. Why do we assume that it is terribly irresponsible for a man to refuse to go to work because he is not in the mood, but a woman can, indeed, ought to, refuse sex because she is not in the mood? Why? The baby boom generation elevated feelings to a status higher than codes of behavior. In determining how one ought to act, feelings, not some code higher than that, became decisive. No shoulds, no oughts in the case of sex. Therefore, the only right time for a wife to have sex with her husband is when she feels like having it. I really can't recommend enough you read this bonkers essay for yourself. As I'm sure you're shocked to hear, Prager University is not a university. It's just a YouTube channel. Think Sargon of Akkad with animated stick figures. But, uh... They also have a budget, which means they can fly in experts to lie for five minutes in front of a green screen. Now, PragerU's favorite type of expert is the one where you get a person from a group to talk about how terrible that group is. Dennis Prager himself is a Jew with very odd ideas about Jews. 
but there are also black hosts to talk about how black people were better off during segregation, women to explain that women get paid less because they're just preternaturally lazy, feminists to talk about how feminism is evil, immigrants from the third world to talk about how shitty immigrants in the third world are, and now they even have artists who hate the idea of artistic expression. Master after master, from Leonardo to Rembrandt to Bierstadt, produced works that inspired, uplifted, and deepened us. But something happened on the way to the 20th century. The profound, the inspiring, and the beautiful were replaced by the new, the different, and the ugly. Okay, first off, new and different are the same thing, Robert. Michelangelo carved his David out of a rock. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art just offers us a rock. A rock. All 340 tons of it. That's how far standards have fallen. Wait, would a smaller rock be better or worse? So this is tactic number one for trying to make modern art look scary. Lies of omission. Because as you can kind of see in the picture, it's actually not just a rock. It's a public art installation. The point of it is you walk under it and it's like a 340 ton sword of Damocles. Like, you can still object to that being art, but you don't need to lie. Whatever their intentions, the new modernists sowed the seeds of aesthetic relativism. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder mentality. Today, everybody loves the Impressionists. But with each new generation, standards declined until there were no standards. All that was left was personal expression. Wow, that's, that's a very scientific graph. What's the unit of measurement on that? Wait, I, I think I've seen that graph before on that old fake news show, Brass Eye. What is the true state of Britain? Basking in rude health? Or sick to the guts? It's the model monitor now reading less than two models per head due to massive value hemorrhage. Well, at least Robert knows to steal from the best like other great artists. The great art historian Jacob Rosenberg wrote that quality in art is not merely a matter of personal opinion, but to a high degree objectively traceable. Would you believe he deceptively edited this quote? It's actually artistic value or quality in great work is not merely a matter of personal opinion, but to a high degree a matter of common agreement among artistically sensitive and trained observers and to a high degree objectively traceable. I guess it would be hard to make a case that all art critics are charlatans and then have to quote a guy who calls them objective arbiters of quality. But the idea of a universal standard of quality in art is now usually met with strong resistance if not open ridicule. How can art be objectively measured? I'm challenged. All right, guys, get ready to hear his objective definition of artistic quality and aesthetic standards. In responding, I simply point to the artistic results produced by universal standards compared to what is produced by relativism. Oh, okay. It's just his personal opinion. Got it. The former gave the world the birth of Venus and the dying Gaul while the latter has given us the Holy Virgin Mary, fashioned with cow dung and pornographic images, and Petra, the prize-winning sculpture of a policewoman squatting and urinating, complete with a puddle of synthetic urine. That painting in the top right has an interesting history, and it brings us to tactic number two for making modern art scary. Regular lies. There's no cow dung in that painting. There's elephant dung, but it's not smeared on fresh. It's part of an old Southern African practice of baking elephant dung and shellacking it to make a more readily available substitute for ebony. It doesn't look like poop, it doesn't smell like poop, and it wasn't meant to be an insult to Mary. Current White House counsel and former mayor of New York Rudy Giuliani actually tried to shut down the Brooklyn Museum for showing this painting. Without aesthetic standards, we have no way to determine quality or inferiority. Here's a test I give my graduate students, all talented and well-educated. Please analyze this Jackson Pollock painting and explain why it is good. It is only after they give very eloquent answers that I inform them that the painting is actually a close-up of my studio apron. All right, so this is hilarious because look at how much he had to tilt the scales to get the result he wanted. If he wanted to prove his point that people can't tell good abstract art from bad, he could have just asked people if they liked the painting. But not only does he first have to rig the contest by name dropping a famous artist, apparently even that wasn't enough, so he has to jam in a loaded question that the students have to answer in order to participate in class, presumably on pain of getting their grades hurt. I don't blame them. How magnanimous of you. Since Bobby is refusing to state the actual objective rules to decide what's good and bad art, maybe we can try to figure it out for ourselves by looking at the examples he puts up. 
He wants realistic depictions of things, even though his art all looks like billboard advertisements for Coca-Cola from the 1930s. Except he also shits on Petra, which is a sculpture in the hyper-realist style. Maybe the problem is what's being depicted as obscene, but then he also cites the dying Gaul and Botticelli's Venus, which both have their private parts hanging out. But Ophelia's Virgin Mary is pornographic. So is the problem that you just can't jerk it to the Ophelia? Wait, Petra gets hit for being gross and realistic, but Death of Marat gets a pass for being pretty. Many of today's artists merely use their art to make statements, often for nothing more than shock value. Artists of the past also made statements at times, but never at the expense of the visual excellence of their work. But if you recall your French history, Death of Marat is literal pro-left-wing death squad propaganda. Which is fine by me, but I can't imagine your friends at Prager you would appreciate it. So I guess the rules are... Be realistic, don't have nudes unless it's suitable spank material, violent far-left political messaging is fine so long as it goes over my head, and just be generically pretty. Oh my god, you know what? I just remembered that butt thing from Paul's videos. This is not art, but this is art. I'm gonna have to invent something here called the Paul Joseph Watson arse art scale. So at one end we have art, this is art, clearly a classic photograph of an arse that must be protected from the attentions of the evil feminists. This, on the other hand, this is not art. This is a pointless and meaningless waste of time and effort. I thought I was just making a dumb straw man argument, but no, these people's definition of real art really is be spank material. Also, he takes a shot at graffiti for no reason, even though that's a medium. That like, could be literally anything. It is they who champion graffiti and call it genius. So, uh, let's just throw B. White in that list for good measure. Robert doesn't just fail to provide any real definition of good art, he also fails to provide any evidence of the actual objective empirical claims he makes. He offers no statistics about what kind of art is getting bought or shown, what the top artists working in a given style are being given in terms of commissions. He gives no examples of a critic actually shunning any artist for works that are realistic. And that's important because it's not true. It's only implied in Robert's video, but it's stated outright in Paul's. Ron Muek produces the most hyper-realist works that the art world has ever seen. Yet it's Matisse who is embraced by the art establishment, while to a large extent, Muek is shunned. Ron Muick has had multiple solo retrospectives of his work in multiple museums across the world. He's a widely celebrated multimillionaire, and he's not even the most famous practitioner of hyperrealism. This is just a straight up lie. Robert doesn't say why these institutions are oppressing us, but fortunately the commenters are here to supply their own theories. Modern art belongs to a larger destructive process, cultural Marxism. They use degenerated people as useful idiots to destroy our civilization. In other simple words, modern art is SJW art. Pure garbage. Modern art. You'd be forgiven for thinking conservatives don't value art at all except for its perceived ability to exert social control. That would certainly explain why they're so bitter about not being able to purge liberals from it. But I suppose there's still a question of why the popular conception of modern art is so dominated by the 90s edgelords of the Young British Artists Movement. And the answer to that is the sickest irony of all. The reason is people like Dennis Prager. Those mutilated cows I like, when they were made way back in the early 90s, they only sold for 20,000 pounds. And they didn't make Damien famous, and in fact, lots of working critics hated them. And lots of critics still hate Hearst for being a shameless self-promoter and sellout, but he and similar artists like Tracy Amin became the most famous artist Britain would produce in a century thanks to endless complaining from Britain's right-wing tabloids. And the red tops, like the YouTubers of our generation, were constantly looking for silly things to blow out of proportion to get outraged, salt-of-the-earth blokes to buy their shit rags and complain to their co-workers about how society was going to collapse any minute, and this was proof. And so emerged a beautiful symbiotic relationship between right-wing media and billionaire art collectors. They could just commission an outrageous work, leak it to Fleet Street, who would raise the profile of the artist by bitching and moaning, and auction it off at a huge profit. It's all just a big cultural Reichstag fire to help keep people round, dumb, red and angry at anything and everything except the plutocrats that are actually fucking up their lives. I try to have a big sweeping point at the end of these videos, but I don't for this. But there's an observation I had while writing the video. 
One thing I've realized watching the ride is they can't conceive of anything new as being an addition rather than a substitution. Literally everything is a zero-sum game to them. Immigrants aren't an addition to a country, but a replacement of the native population. Hey everyone! Okay, so today we are going to be talking about a very serious subject. Something that I think a lot of people are too afraid to talk about because they're worried about being called a bigot. Adding non-Western cultures to the canon of great art or literature isn't expanding the canon, it's erasing the works of Shakespeare and Chaucer. It's now possible to complete an English degree and never encounter Shakespeare. One of those dead white males whose works underlie our society of oppression. And modern art isn't expanding the traditional notions of classical beauty or transcendence, it's destroying it. How did the thousand-year ascent towards artistic perfection and excellence die out? It didn't. It was pushed out. Imagine going through life like that. You could never encounter a novel idea, an unexpected situation, or an unfamiliar experience without being gripped by the terror that everything you had previously known and loved was about to be destroyed. It's enough to make me pity these people. People I usually can't muster any feeling for except hate. Maybe this could be the start of a new empathetic sarcasmatron. Remember, how'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oop, never mind, it's gone. Jesus, I'm almost at a thousand subscribers. I'm thinking this might be the point in the YouTube channel where the bad guys are going to notice and start trying to trick a SWAT team into killing my dog. So, if you want to help fill my dead dog and broken door replacement fund, try my new Patreon. Donate to my new Patreon. I actually have one now. Bye. What neighborhood was it in? I don't know. Where's the house? I don't know.